This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. We sang, I See the Lord, and that is from Isaiah chapter 6, if you want to turn with me there. In Isaiah the 6th chapter, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. So that that we were singing, of course, the train of his robe, that, that means the, 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 long, the long part, the flowing part of his robe. So whatever the imagery is, is, is pretty uh, grandiose here, I'm sure. And he goes on, Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings, and with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to one another, and they called to another, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And so that's where we get that refrain from that song, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called. So imagine, this is just a very powerful vision. And the house filled with smoke, and I said, Woe is me. Now that part I noticed didn't make it into the song. <laughs> but it's important. Isaiah says, Woe is me. I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. So Isaiah, I think, is saying here, you know, I'm just not up to this. I'm not up to the presence of God. I'm not up to seeing God in this way. And the people, we're just, we're just not worthy. I think it's, I think it's Isaiah's expression of saying, we're, we're, I'm just not worthy of this. We're not worthy to be able to be in such uh, closeness in terms of the presence of God. He's saying, you know, it's, for Isaiah, it's, it's as if he's been just uh, trans, uh, transported just right into, in before the presence of God. That's how close he is, and that's how, how vivid this all is for him. And yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I'm unclean. My lips are unclean. Remember how that Jesus would, would later say, you know, out, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, speaks, right? It's the word uh, 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 that we speak that, that really shows forth uh, the abundance of who we are. What we, you can't really separate uh, anyone from their word. You, you, can't, you can't separate God from His word as if His word is something separate and apart from Him. You can't, uh, you can't separate Jesus from His word. You can't separate uh, anybody from their word. They are uh, who they say they are. Now, you say, well, what, well, what if I'm dealing with a liar? <laughs> I know that. We lie to each other, and yet, and yet even then, even, even in our lies, it's amazing. You, you're still getting a picture of, uh, of who we are inside, if you really stop and think about it. Our words. So I think that's what's the, the types of thoughts that he's uh, dealing with here when he makes this exclamation. You know, I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I'm just, he's just saying I'm just not worthy. And the people, uh, we're, just, we're just not worthy. And yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now notice this in, in verse 6. You're familiar with this, of course, but uh, reading it again uh, new today. Then one of the seraphs flew to me holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. So, so notice that in this tableau that we have here, in this vision that we have here, we also have an altar and we have one of these uh, uh, angelic, uh, beings of the heavenly hosts that is now dispatched, if you will, to go and take a live coal. So you can picture that in your mind. We don't know exactly what Isaiah was seeing, but but we get you know we can sort of imagine, visualize what that must have been like. Just a uh, you can picture it, just a red hot, I'm sure, burning coal off of uh, something that something that's burning, and uh, on the altar they would have the you know burning. Uh, incense and and and, and uh, animal sacrifices and different things, but before before the altar. But you can imagine this this burning hot coal off of the altar. But imagine how precious that must be, because I think I think it's very specific what Isaiah is saying here. Where did the coal come from? 
The coal fr came from this altar, this place of, uh, this consecrated place, this uh, 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 holy place. And he takes the coal, and what does the what does the being what does the seraph what what does he do with it? So it's, it's amazing. He says, "The seraph touched my mouth with it," and Isaiah said, "Ouch." <laughs> Well, you'd imagine it would be, but this, of course, in, in this in this vision that he's seeing, he he took he took this hot coal and he touched his mouth with it, and he and he says, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt is departed and your sin is blotted out. So it's amazing that what we have we have this this little this little you know I would assume not very huge it didn't say a boulder it says, it says a little coal just this one little coal off of the altar of God off of the consecrated place uh, before before God and 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 it's able to uh, it's able to according to the seraph say this cleanses you. This cleanses you. You talk about you have unclean lips. That's all right. I'll t we'll take this that's consecrated by God and we'll take this that, and have this touch your lips and you'll be clean. And your sin will be blotted out. And so what? what why do you think God sent that, sent that being, sent that seraph uh, to do that? I mean, that had to have been under God's orders, right? Why, why do you think God would have done that? Was it not to comfort Isaiah? Because Isaiah, I think, is, is genuinely pretty scared. I mean, Isaiah didn't see God face to face every day. He realized this is pretty special, what, what's going on here today. And Isaiah is just, he's, he's almost just perplexed. He's, he's just, he, he, he's, he's just uh, scared, I would think, probably, a lot of it scared and guilty and awed and amazed. And he says, you know, I can't do this. I can't, I can't be here. I, none of my people should be here. The children of Israel, none of us, we shouldn't be in this position. Are you kidding? And yet, God, I think, to comfort Isaiah, sends this and, and does this and takes just one little coal off the altar and touches his lips and says, now you're clean. Wow. It's amazing. In verse 8, then I heard the, vo the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Imagine this, if you will. Think about this, if you will. Why is it that God gave the prophet Isaiah this vision to begin with? Well, just because God wanted to be nice. God wanted to do something. I think that God was actually preparing Isaiah to commission him for a purpose that he had for him. And so this incredible vision is granted to Isaiah, and it's an amazing thing. It's, you know, the train of his robe, the, the hem of his garment fills the temple. It's an amazing thing. And all of these glorious angelic beings around, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Wow. Wow. But the purpose of that wasn't, I think, just to awe Isaiah. It was to prepare Isaiah, to let Isaiah know, I have purpose for you. I have, I have, uh, I have plan for you. And I need you to do something for me. God saying this to Isaiah, figuratively, of course. I need you for purpose. That's why... God showed Isaiah a vision of himself. God showing Isaiah a vision of himself. That's why God said to Isaiah, let, uh, allowing Isaiah, pulling the curtain back, if you will, and saying, look, look at the God you serve. Look at me. See me. Because God wants Isaiah to do something. He wants Isaiah for purpose. Faith is not... I believe, just an end in itself. I believe that faith throughout the Scriptures, if you really look at it, faith is always to an end, to a purpose, to a fulfillment of some will of God that He wants performed, something that He wants acted out. And I don't mean just performed on a stage or acted out like in a farce. I mean really walked out, lived out, done out. That's faith to me throughout the Scriptures. And you see that from the beginning to end. I, uh, I, the Apostle Paul and all of his uh, wonderful revelations and understandings of, about faith to me uh, do not never contradict the things that
that we've seen before about faith uh, in the balance of the scriptures. In fact, isn't it Paul himself, the Apostle Paul, who brings up Abraham, who really is the father of, uh, of all the faithful, according to the Apostle Paul, and I agree with him. And he, he's bringing out Abraham, which goes back even back before Moses to say, look, here's faith. You want to see pictures of faith. You want to see pictures of, of faith, what faith, is, what faith is and what faith is like. It's about God sometimes giving opportunity to certain individuals and then certain individuals saying yes I will and certain individuals then actually uh, walking it out, living it out. As you've heard, us say, heard me say uh, many times, you know, Abraham had faith. How do we know he had faith? He had faith with his feet. We talk about faith being something that, that you have in your heart. Faith is something that you have in your heart. Talk about faith being something you have maybe in your, in your mind or in your consciousness. Faith is something you have in your mind, in your consciousness. It's something you have to determine and to decide. But we know that Abraham had faith because Abraham had faith in his feet. When God said to Abraham, leave your country and your kindred and come to this land that I will show you and that I will give you, Abraham got up on his feet, put one foot in front of the other, and went. This is, this is the same type of imagery that you'll see re or, uh, rehearsed or, or repeated over and over and over again throughout the Scriptures. And here, in this vision of Isaiah, you've got something similar going on. Here's an incredible pulling back of the, of, the, uh, of the veil, of the curtain, so to speak, and allowing Isaiah to see God in His glory, see an amazing thing. And the first thing that uh, faithful Isaiah says is, I'm not worthy, I'm not clean to see this. And so God, I believe, takes care of that, helps him with that, and saying, look, 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 look. All I have to do is just touch you, and you're clean. All I have to do is just, is, is just make connection between <laughs> what's consecrated before me and you, and you are clean. You're well, it is well. But God then quickly turns to the verse we just read, verse 8, and He says, Whom shall I send who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. Verse 9. And He said, Go! <laughs> so God had a job for Isaiah, did He not? Go and say to this people, Keep listening. But do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. You'll recognize this passage. It's quoted by Jesus, and probably we're going to go and look at that uh, here in just in just a moment, where uh, one of the places where he quotes it. But God says to Isaiah, "Go and say to this people, keep listening, don't comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand." In verse ten, he says, "Make the mind of this people dull." and stop their ears, and shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and comprehend with their minds, comprehend with their minds, and turn and be healed. So God had a purpose for Isaiah. But first, He had to do something about Isaiah's unclean lips. He doesn't tell Isaiah, your, your, your lips are already clean. Or I don't mind that your lips are unclean. We'll just take care of that anyway. He takes the, the coal, or has it, has the seraph, take the coal from the consecrated altar in his presence, touch that to his lips, and the, and the, and the seraph can then say, now you're clean. And then notice in verse 11, Then I said, remember, because he said, you know, they're going to hear but not hear. They're going to they're gonna see but not understand. They're gonna, uh, with, their minds are not going to comprehend. And then verse 11, look at what Isaiah says. How long, O Lord? How long? So he, so he does tell Isaiah. Isaiah asks him, well, how much further is it? How long, how long am I going to be doing this? How, long, you know, how, long, how big of a job is it? When are we going to be done? 
Till cities lie waste without inhabitant, houses without people, the land is, uh, until the land is utterly desolate, until the Lord sends everyone far away and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land, even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains uh, standing when it is felled. The holy seed, though, is its stump. What I think God is pretty, making pretty clear to Isaiah is this may not end Rosalie, for you. You may not see beauty and wonder and a happy ending and a Hollywood fade to black, but what's incumbent upon Isaiah is that he keep putting one foot in front of the other, and yet there will be a sprig, if you will, a new shoot of hope. Let's go to the New Testament and look at that for a second. Matthew, the 13th chapter. From the days of Isaiah to the days of Jesus are many days. But eventually, Jesus does come and He does begin to preach and He does begin to speak. The Messiah is there and He is giving forth the Word of God. And in Matthew 13, chapter and verse 10, then the disciples came to him and asked him, Why do you speak in parables? Because they'd already they'd obviously seen him do that quite a bit already. And in verse 11, he answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not been given. This is where he'll he'll quote in just a moment. For to those who have, more will be given. They will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Verse 13, the reason I speak to them in parables. What is the reason I speak to them in parables? Is that seeing they don't perceive and hearing they don't listen and they don't understand. It's almost a verbatim quote from what God had told Isaiah that we just read back as recorded in Isaiah the 6th chapter. We don't always see. But for those of us that have the opportunity to see, and this is an amazing thing, let's skip on down to verse 16. Because Jesus, after quoting from this passage in Isaiah, saying, look, the words are always out there, and not everybody always hears, not everybody always sees it, not everyone always perceives it, much less everyone acting upon it. Remember, Jesus said uh, in another uh, example, parable, if you will, Remember he said, the person who hears these sayings of mine and acts upon them is the man who builds his house upon the rock. Remember? But notice he says that very specifically. He says, the one who hears these sayings upon, uh, of mine and, listen, acts upon them. It's all in there. The one who hears these things of mine and acts upon them. This is the man, the wise man, who builds his house upon rock. The rock. So, amazing. But not all see and not all perceive, much less act upon. But then notice in verse 16 what he says to those who are his. The ones to whom the secrets, if you will, the hidden things of the kingdom of heaven are given to know and understand. Notice what he says in verse 16. Blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Many people would have heard Jesus himself speak and many times not value or seek to know more of what he was really trying to communicate. But for those who did, how precious, how wonderful, and how blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Truly I tell you, listen, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Many prophets and righteous people, including, I would say, the prophet Isaiah, from whom Jesus is quoting, and whom we read about what he saw earlier. Think about what he did see. Isaiah saw an incredible vision. He saw an incredible picture of God Himself upon His throne and how beautiful and wonderful that was. 
And now we come down here all these many years later and somebody uh, w uh, in, in our day and in our time has taken from, from that passage and adapted it and made a wonderful song that we can now sing. And we can sing from what Isaiah saw. It's amazing, isn't it? I see the Lord seated on the throne. He is exalted and the train of His robe fills the temple. And holy is the Lord. All these things are from what Isaiah saw. And many other things in the book of Isaiah we know. Many other things were revealed to Isaiah about what God was going to do when He brought that Messiah. But it was a many, 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 many years until Jesus of Nazareth stands in that synagogue, sits in that synagogue of Nazareth and says, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your hearing. And his own disciples would ask him, well, why do you speak and tell, the, tell these stories? And he brings up what God had told Isaiah. He says, you know, they're going to hear, but they're not going to hear. They're going to see, but they're not going to perceive. They're going to their minds, but no understanding, no comprehension. But to you, blessed are your eyes. What do you see when you see the Lord? What do you see when you see the Lord God high and lifted up? and the train of his robe filling the temple. I'm reminded of what a disciple of Jesus Christ named Stephen was allowed to see. Stephen, who was not given a Disney happy fairy tale ending to his story either, now was he? Stephen, who for his belief in Christ, stood and had to give forth testimony that his audience didn't want to hear. And it cost him his life. We all know that story, right? But you also remember what Stephen was allowed to see. Isaiah was allowed to see something incredible and something great. Servant of God. What did the servant of God named Stephen, what was he allowed to see? In the moment of his death, it says he looked up and he shouted. I believe he shouted. He cried out. Behold, I see the glory of God. Now, I don't know if he saw any seraphs. I don't know if he saw the train of God's robe filling the temple. I don't know what he saw, but whatever it was, I mean, he's giving his life. He didn't get, he didn't get the luxury uh, that Isaiah got to really describe things in detail. But he says, Behold, I see the glory of God. And I see who? Jesus. Standing at the right hand of God. Blessed are, blessed were Stephen's eyes, for they saw, they saw something incredible. They saw the completion of the work, the reconciliation that other prophets and other righteous people, as Jesus himself said there just a moment ago, he saw the fulfilled picture of what they were just looking forward to. Stephen gave his life in faith. And God gave him a picture as well to give him confidence, to give him boldness, to give him comfort in his final moments. Behold, I see the glory of God and I see the Son of Man. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Wow! So you might have a bad day in God sometime. I don't think, I hope, I pray not, that you'll never have 
40 bad days, or say bad, tough days, like our Lord Jesus had to have out in the wilderness. I certainly hope you don't have a bad day like Stephen did his last day. I hope you never have a bad day like that. But isn't the message this, that even if we did, God stands beside and with those people who stand up for Him, who are willing to follow Him, who are willing to be faithful to Him. Isn't that the real message that we're supposed to get from the balance of these things? What example is there in the Scripture of God abandoning a man or a woman who is willing to stand for His Word, His truth? Give me the example of where God says, Ah, I'm going to leave them. Show me the example where God said, Ah, it's, it's, nah, I'm not interested. You're going to stand for me and for my will? Nah, do it on your own. Show me the example where God abandons His people. We're not going to find that. We can find plenty of people abandoning God, but I can't find a single example of God ever abandoning a people who stick up for Him and for His Word and for His truth. Doesn't mean it's always going to be easier. Doesn't mean the days are, are, are always going to be easy. Doesn't mean that there won't be bad days. There can be. There's always plenty of people that are willing to help us have a bad day in God. There's always plenty of circumstances that, that will uh, uh, present themselves that, that will make it very tough for us to have a great and wonderful and, you know, birds chirping and tiptoe through the tulips and everything's wonderful day in God. But I also know this. There will never be a day in God where God abandons a people who cling to Him and will not let Him go. And occasionally there will be days in which He'll pull the curtain back. He knows when. He knows how. He knows why. But occasionally there will be days in which God will pull the curtain back and He'll allow an Isaiah to see glory and power. He'll allow a, a Stephen to see glory and power to give us courage to make us through so that we would not give up, so that we would be faithful in, if need be unto the end. Blessed are your eyes for you see. Blessed are your ears for you hear, you listen. You are blessed. Just stick with God. He will bless you. So when I sing the song, I See the Lord, I'm very thankful to be singing along and in a, in a bit, in an extended way, being able to participate somewhat in what Isaiah saw. But I'm also so much even more thankful that when I look to heaven, I can see the glory of God. And I can also picture and also know Jesus is at the right hand of God. And the one who was to come did come and will return again in glory and in power and in strength. And He will reveal yet more and in fullness the glory of His Father when He returns to establish His kingdom. That day shall come. And all of this that we experience now, the good days and the bad days, the hard days and the easier days, but the, t the tough ones are the ones we remember. But the days of defeat and the days of sadness and the days of ridicule and the days of the tongue wagging and the days uh, 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 of the hardness and the days of the, of the pressure and the days of all of those things will fade into nothingness. 
when the full glory of God in His kingdom is revealed. Stay the course is our message. Stay the course with God. And you will not. You will not be abandoned. You will not fail. He is able to bear us up. Can you say amen?